reflect on things that you're thankful for. And just really thinking about how blessed we are as, as a people uh, here at this church uh, and the country we live in to have uh, the freedom to worship. There, I've, I've seen reports from so many missionaries in other countries and some countries are persecuted and, and every time they meet together there's the fear and the threat that this could be their last time meeting as a church body. Um, there's people who don't have access to a Bible and probably most of us, if you're like myself, you probably have two, three, four Bibles sitting around you know, different places in your house. And there's people, Christians in other countries, who if they can get just one page of the Bible, they would be thrilled. Uh, so we, we have so much to be thankful for, and, and I just want to thank Pastor Allen uh, for this opportunity. Uh, tonight we're going to be in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And, and this is a passage I've, I've studied before, and I, I've actually preached from here at this church. But I went through this, this passage and, and did a really... Uh, in-depth, even more than usual study through this passage, and I found some really interesting things that I want to share with you tonight that kind of expanded my understanding of this passage and really uh, convicted me in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and I actually preached uh, through this about a month and a half ago at uh, my brother-in-law's church, and uh, it, it was an unusual service because uh, it was their homecoming at the church. And I got up and, and was preaching and it was about halfway through the message and I noticed several people in the church were all of a sudden heading to the back and I was like what's going on back there you know I didn't know if there was an emergency or what was going on and and then I saw a, a person in the back had kind of fallen over and I thought you know maybe that person was asleep or something like that maybe I put her to sleep with my preaching but I realized that sh- this person had a medical emergency going on and so I was halfway through my, my, my message, uh, stopped right there. They, they called the EMS. They come and they came out and they, they looked at her, took care of her. Uh, it turns out she just had uh, like an issue with her, her blood pressure and her sugar levels, but she was, thankfully, she was okay. And I thought that was going to be the end of the message. I only got halfway through it. But then they said, we, we really want to hear the second half of your message, what you, what you have left, what you didn't get to finish. So come to the fellowship hall and, and finish up. So here I go to the fellowship hall, not knowing what to expect. And over here on this side of me is the dessert table, right there. And you know, I love dessert. And there's pies and there's cookies and all that kind of stuff. And then right over here on this side is the fried chicken and all the other good homecoming food. I'm like, man, how in the world am I going to finish this message with, you know, with food on both sides of me like this? But it was definitely... Uh, unusual service. I've never experienced anything uh, quite like that before. Um, that was the last time I preached that, so hopefully tonight we won't have any, uh, any crazy things happen uh, like that. I hope not. But uh, Romans chapter 12, uh, beginning in verse 1, Paul writing here says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's open tonight with a word of prayer. Father God, I come before you now and I thank you for this privilege and this blessing that I have tonight to stand before these people and to share with them what I've studied, the, the truths that you have brought to light, that you would have helped me to study and learn. And Father, I pray tonight, as we look at this passage, that you would help make the truth of your word clear, that you would speak through me and use me and use your word, Father, to change hearts, to change lives, and to change us, Father, to be more like you, to be more like Christ. And so, Father, I pray now the blessings on the preaching of your word that you would use this time and that you would speak to our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. I came across an interesting story uh, that was shared. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, years ago, he had 
going to a conference with another man, and this man publicly proclaimed and said that Christians could reach a place in their life of sinless perfection to where they could never sin again. And of course, we don't believe that. That's not what the Bible teaches, but this man firmly believed it. And so Charles Spurgeon said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to put this guy to the test. And so the next morning, uh, Charles Spurgeon walks into the room. The guy's sitting down. He's eating his breakfast, probably reading the newspaper, just having himself a relaxing morning. And Charles Spurgeon, he, he sounds like a little kid with what he did. He, he kind of sneaks up behind the guy, gets right behind him, and he takes a jug of milk and he pours it on this poor man. He pours it right on top of the man. And the man, he turns around his face as red as can be and just goes into a long, angry rant of profanity and all sorts of things. And Charles Spurgeon said, you haven't reached sinless perfection quite yet. <laughs> now, I would never do something like that, but Spurgeon was trying to prove a point to this man. He was trying to show this man that, look, you have pride in your life. You think that you've achieved this place where you are not capable of sinning, that you could never sin again, but really, you are just still struggling with sin like the rest of us. And Paul, throughout Romans, and the pastor has been going through uh, Romans, it's been a really good, interesting study. I've learned a lot from it so far. And one of the things you see as you study through the book of Romans, is that Paul talks about that sinful nature and the struggle that we as Christians face. It is something that every single one of us in here tonight faces on a daily basis, young or old. We have that temptation that faces us every single day to violate and do the things that would contradict God's Word. So look with me in verse 1, and I want to show you some interesting things tonight. And if you take notes, I have a lot of uh, word studies and things that will really bring this passage to life. But look with me, beginning in verse 1. I beseech you, brethren, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Now this phrase, mercies of God, is very significant because it points back to everything that Paul has been teaching us about who God is in the first 11 chapters of Romans. In chapter 1, verse 7, he says we are the beloved of God. In chapter 3, verse 24, he says that believers through Christ have been justified and made righteous. In Romans 1.16, he talks about the power of God in salvation to transform us into a new creation. In Romans 2.4, he talks about God's kindness and His patience to us. In Romans 3.25, he teaches us how our sins have been forgiven if we've placed our faith in Him. Romans 6.18, that we have freedom from sin. One person put it this way. He said, We have been reconciled with Him, justified, and conformed to the image of Jesus, and received the gift of eternal life. And now Paul comes to chapter 12, verse 1. He says, In light of all that God has done for us. That should motivate us as Christians to live obediently to God. That should be the driving motivation, when we see everything that God has done for us, how He has poured out His love, how He has been merciful for us, how there are many times in our life where He has protected us, where He has brought us through the valleys, where He has been with us every step of the way, even when we did not love Him. In John chapter 3, one of the most interesting aspects of that chapter is this. The famous verse, John 3.16, for God so loved the world. And the emphasis there in that passage, I love it. I, I studied behind one person who brought that out. And he said, John is talking about how despite how wicked and sinful all the people of the world are, God still loves them. Despite the fact that when God looks at mankind and sees that there is nothing in us that is worthy of God's love and affection and His mercy, that God still loves us. And that is because God 
is love. He loves perfectly and completely. He loves the unlovable. And Paul, reflecting on all of that, says, in light of everything God has done by the mercies of God, that should now motivate us to a transformed way of living. Now notice this next phrase, and we're going to spend a good amount of time here. That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. Now, living sacrifice is really interesting here because Paul is drawing on the Old Testament practice of a sacrifice. And here's what they had to do in the Old Testament. A Jewish person would bring his offering of an animal. He would take it and bring it to the priest. And then the priest would take that animal. They would slay it and place it on the altar on behalf of the person who brought it. People got to this point where they thought, all I have to do to be forgiven of my sin is go through the motions of buying this animal, taking it to the priest, letting the priest perform the sacrifice, and then going and living however I want to. But that was not the point. That was supposed to be symbolic of the sacrifice that Christ would make. You see, these people reached a point where they thought that all they had to do to please God was go through the motions and offer this sacrifice without any regard to a change in their own attitude and their life. And yet in the Old Testament, Psalm 51, 17, David writes this, he says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, Thou wilt not despise. You see, what God wanted was not the sacrifice. He wanted the heart and the commitment of His people. In 1 Samuel 15, 22, it says, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. You see, the point of the sacrificial system in the Old Testament was never just going through this ritual and checking this off your checklist. It was all about the people seeing the cost of their sin. That their sin required the life of another. And it was a great sacrifice, and therefore their heart and their attitude should change in conformity to God and His Word. But... As you read through the Old Testament, you see time and time again, what do the people of Israel do? They follow after other gods. They reject God. They may still do the sacrifices, but they're not changing their heart and their attitude and their life. They're just going through the motions. And here's what Paul has in mind here with the phrase, a living sacrifice. Paul is saying here that we are to present our lives as a sacrifice, as a commitment to God. We are to put to death our old sinful nature, our, our desires, our temptations. We are to put those things behind us and offer our life and our, our emotions, our will, our desire, everything up to God. And not to continue to be selfish and to cling to our own sinful ways. But he goes further with the illustration. Notice the word, present your bodies. The word body here is talking about more than the skin and the bones and the flesh. It is talking about everything that we are, the totality of who you are as a person. And we are told to present our bodies. The word present here means to surrender up to yield, to offer, and I love this last definition, to hold nothing back. So when Paul says to present your bodies, in other words, you could paraphrase it as to hold nothing back from God. To offer Him your entire life, your will, your emotions, everything that you are, you are holding nothing back from God. When we commit to follow Jesus and place our faith in Him. We are presenting Him with all that we are and holding absolutely nothing back. 
We are dedicating our entire life as one of service to God and to obey Him. But notice what comes next in verse 1. The word holy. Now the word here has holy has the idea of something that is set apart in service to the Lord and has turned away from sin. In other words, Paul is saying that we are to pursue moral purity and obedience and conformity to the commands of God in every area of our life. Our life is to be one that is set apart, that is distinct, that is different from the world. But oftentimes, the world today and the culture we live in, the question is, how close to sin can I get and still be okay? How far can I go and still be okay? But the person who is set apart to God doesn't look at it that way. They say, what is there in my life that needs to be brought in obedience to God and His Word? It doesn't say, oh, what in there in my life can I just kind of justify and explain away and, and not really think about it. It's not that big of a deal. No, the person who is set apart to God is constantly examining their heart, examining their life, and saying, what is there in my life that is not in obedience to God? You know why we don't ask that question? Because it's a painful question to ask. Because that requires us to look at our own hearts and our lives in the mirror. And when we do that, It's really easy to start to see our faults and our failures. So, in order to avoid that, we oftentimes get into the habit of looking at the faults and the failures of other people around us and ignore our own. And if we're honest with ourselves, all of us in here have done that. I know I have. But he goes further. The phrase acceptable unto God could be better understood or translated as pleasing unto God. Now, when I think of the word acceptable, if my teacher, if I was in school and I I took a test and, and the teacher gave me back my score and she said, well, your score is acceptable. That doesn't really sound very good, right? And if I tell my my parents, hey, uh, my report card grades are acceptable. Do you think my parents are going to look at that and be like, wow, Tyler's doing his best, good job. No, they're going to look at that and be like, acceptable, that's probably not that good, right? That's just, just good enough. But the word acceptable here is better translated as pleasing. And that completely changes the way we see it, right? Acceptable unto God versus pleasing unto God. It's not that this is just okay with God. It's that it is pleasing to God when we live this way. When we live with a life of total surrender to God, it is pleasing to the Lord. It is pleasing to the Lord. Now, the end of the verse, the final phrase, which is your reasonable service? The word here translated as reasonable is in the Greek logikos, which is where we get our English word logic from. If you say something is logical, it makes sense. It, it, it's something that uh, makes sense to us. And so the phrase here, as reasonable service, can also be seen as true worship or service of worship. Paul is saying that that is the only thing we should respond with in light of everything that God has done to truly worship God. To only give God partial commitment does not make logical sense. That's what Paul is saying. To only give God a partial commitment does not make logical sense. And really, when you look throughout the entire New Testament, there's nowhere that Jesus leaves an option for partial commitment. He says to people to take up your cross and follow Me, to be willing to surrender and abandon everything. And we look at that passage and we think, well... Here in America, we don't have to deal with persecution. We don't have to deal with the things that the disciples dealt with. So what does that even mean for us today? I'll tell you what it means for us today. 
there are many things in our life that we hold on to and we cling to that are keeping us from being as close to God as we should be. And that sacrificial attitude is one where we are willing to leave everything behind. You see, if, if God were to come in here tonight and say, sell all your possessions like He did to the rich young ruler, to sell all your possessions and go be a missionary. Leave it all behind. Go to a country where you won't have air condition, where the bugs will be biting you, where when you get an injury there's not proper medical care, where you'll never see your family again face to face. And go to that country, sell everything you have, leave it all behind, and go serve me there. How many of us would jump to do that? You see, the rich young ruler went away because he had great wealth. And when he was called to truly commit to Jesus, he couldn't do it. But ask yourselves, if that was me, and God told me to sell everything I had and to leave my family and my friends and everyone that I know and love and care about and go to a place that would be scary, where I don't know anyone, where I'm the outsider, would I do it? That is how we ought to think of our commitment to God. Have you put yourself in the shoes of that rich young ruler and asked yourself, what would I do if God asked me that question? What would I do if I was that man standing in front of Jesus and He told me to sell everything, leave your family, leave your friends, and follow me? Do I have that type of commitment and love for God? You see, Paul is asking us to, to examine ourselves in a very tough way. He is calling us to examine and say, is my commitment a total commitment to God? Have I fully surrendered my life? And that is exactly what Jesus was asking the rich young ruler for. For that total commitment. Now looking at verse 2. Paul begins to give us some practical ways that we can live our life as a living sacrifice. One of the questions I like to oftentimes ask when I read a passage of Scripture is, okay, now that I know the truth of Scripture, how do I live it out? What does this look like for me today in our culture as a Christian? How do I live this truth out? And so Paul gives us that in verse 2. The solution. First of all, he says, be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world. What's interesting about this, Robert Piccarelli had this to say. He said, the world system is an entire way of life under the supervision of Satan, who is the God of this world. It is carefully organized to express the philosophy and the mind of the wicked one. Thus, we are always under pressure to be pressed into the mold of the age. We must resist. I love that. I love how he words that and, and defines for us what the world system is. In other words, what Picker really says is that what you see in you around us in the world and the culture that is so anti-God, it is carefully crafted by Satan himself to lure and destroy and draw people away from God. And by the way, that's nothing new. If you look at the seven churches in Revelation, one of the common themes that you see described in detail there is how it is described that Satan is at work in the world system at that time to try and destroy those churches. And at that time, it was the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire, of course, you read about Nero and different other people who intensely persecuted Christians and tried to wipe out Christianity. I won't go into detail, uh, but there are some very terrible, wicked things that Nero and others did to try to stamp out Christianity. And what it says in Revelation is this, that behind 
those leaders like Nero and others, Satan is working. He is manipulating those leaders, those governments, those political systems, all of those things to oppress the church. To destroy Christians, to destroy and discourage. And he works in the culture today to try to do the same thing. You see, I think the danger we face in America is not persecution. It is being comfortable. It's being comfortable. We have so much around us. At Thanksgiving, I was talking uh, to my uncle, and he went on a missions trip to India, and he showed me a picture of the church there, and it just blew my mind. He had a, a video clip of the people singing and, and worshiping in their native language, and they were so happy. And all the church was was a few sticks on each corner and branches for the roof. No chairs, no seats, no closed walls, no air condition, nothing. But you could see in the distance of the video, as the people were worshiping and singing songs to God, you could see more and more people kind of coming from all different directions to this church service to listen, to see what it was all about. And I was thinking about how heaven one day will be made up of people from all over the world. And here's my point in saying this. We are so comfortable and blessed here in America that I think that is the danger and the temptation that Satan uses to get us from fully committing to God. Because we're so, so used to the comforts and the nice things that we have that if God were to call us anywhere else, well, God, I can't leave behind my family. I can't believe, leave, leave behind all these nice things I've, I've worked so hard for. But God says, I require total commitment. Whatever the cost, whatever I call you to do. Do not conform to this world. Let me say this, what we feed our minds will greatly influence the way we think and we behave. The command of not conforming to the world is this. It is a call to resist the pressure to be squeezed into the mold of the world and the pattern of behavior of the people in the world. Now we have numerous sources of information in this day and age of technology. We have newspapers. Of course, that's kind of fading out, but we used to have newspapers. We have internet. We have television. We have social media. We have movies, music, education systems, sports, and cell phones to influence us. Now, here's some statistics I'm going to share with you that when I came across them, I, I, I couldn't even believe the numbers. Uh, it just blows your mind. The average American watches more than four hours of television per day. Now, if you live to be 65 years old, based on four hours of TV per day, which is the average, at 65 years of age, you will have spent nine years of that time just watching TV. The Bible tells us to redeem the time because our life is but a vapor. What are we doing? Nine out of 65 years gone to the television. When we think of it in that terms, it makes a big difference in how we look at our, our media consumption, right? Now get this. Parents in the survey spent an average amount of three and a half minutes per week, not per day, per week in meaningful conversation with their own children. Isn't that sad? Three and a half minutes of meaningful conversation with their children per week. The average person in the survey spent five to six hours a day on their cell phone. And for those who played video game, the average amount of time 
spent was 16 and a half hours per week on video games. You see, Satan has brought so many distractions in our culture. We have TV, we have cell phones, we have video games. It's no wonder we don't have time to read our Bible, to go out and witness, to go out and talk to other people, to disciple people, because we're spending all of our time on these things that won't make a difference. We're distracted. We're comfortable. We're quick to reach for our smartphone, for video games or TV remote when we have spare time. But how often do we just say, hey, I've got some, some spare time. I'm going to pick up my Bible instead. I'm going to spend some time in prayer. Is that our first thought? When we have time that we, we, we don't have anything scheduled that we can use? Or is it just, I need to be entertained with something. So we pick up our cell phone, or we play a video game, or we turn the TV on, or we find some other form of media to entertain us, like TikTok and YouTube and all those things. Now notice what he says next in verse 2, and I'll bring this all to a conclude, close shortly. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This transformation and change takes place as you renew your mind. And by the way, this is a lifelong process of renewing your mind. It is not a one-time thing you do at the time of salvation or once a week or once a year. Renewing your mind is a lifelong daily process. A lifelong daily process. The Holy Spirit works in us to convict us and change us but you also, your responsibility is to be engaged in the process of renewing your mind. This reprogramming of the mind does not take place overnight. But it is a lifelong process by which our way of thinking is to resemble more and more the way that God wants us to think. It is a lifelong process and something that we must actively engage in every single day. And by the way, the way that we renew our mind is by reading God's Word, meditating on it, memorizing Scripture, and seeking it as the foundation for all our decisions in life. The Puritans of old were famous uh, for their pursuit of holiness and here's what one person said about them. He said that God's own word was the instrument His own Holy Spirit uses to renew our minds, which in turn He uses to transform our living. The transformed and renewed mind is a mind that is saturated and controlled by the word of God. It is a mind that spends as little time as possible with the necessary things of earthly living and as much time as possible with the things of God. God. The end result of this renewal of your mind is that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And here's the last word I want to look at, the word prove. This word means to test or examine. And what Paul is saying here is that we must examine and test every area of our life to see if it is in line with what the Word of God says is godly living. Every area of our life, we are to test and examine ourselves. Now let me bring all of this to a conclusion tonight and an application for us as Christians. I've got two applications for us you can take home with you. First of all, first application is this. Paul teaches us that as Christians, our life must display a new way of living and thinking that aligns with God's Word. This is a lifelong process, a daily process of maturing and growth that takes place with the Holy Spirit's work in your heart, in your mind, in your life. But it also requires that you and I are active and engaged in that process. It's not a one-way street. The Holy Spirit does the Holy Spirit's part, but you and I also must do our own part to renew our mind and to grow in our knowledge of Christ. But second, 
Holiness comes as we focus our hearts and our minds on God's Word. What you feed your mind will influence your thinking and behavior. You see, you hear it all the time, but consistent reading and study of God's Word is absolutely vital to this growth that Paul's talking about. It is absolutely a necessary part in our walk with God. Meditating is important. To think deeply about God's Word, how it applies to our life, and how we can live it out. To also study God's Word. You know, we'll we'll be approached by people who will question and challenge our faith. If we don't study God's Word and know what it says, how will we ever answer those people? And also, and this is a big one, memorizing God's Word. Hiding it in our heart. Here's why memorizing God's Word is so important. Because it gives us the tools that we need to resist temptation. You remember what Jesus did when He was tempted by Satan? Every single time He quoted Scripture. He quoted the Word of God. He had an answer, and His answer came from God's Word. If we're not memorizing and learning the truths of Scripture, then when we're tempted, we won't know how to fight it. Because we haven't taken the time to learn and memorize the truths of God's Word. But if you hide them in your heart, when Satan tempts you, when you are faced with temptations on a daily basis, you will call to memory those Bible verses and those truths and be able to use those. And God will encourage you and help you and strengthen you in those times of temptation. But we are responsible for taking the time to do that. Let me close with this question tonight. Our hearts, our mind, and our choices in life will be guided by either the values of our culture or God's Word. One of the two. Your heart, your mind, and your choices will be guided either by the values of the culture or by God's Word. Which one defines your life? Which one, when other people look at you, do they see a person who is living a godly life, a transformed life, a life of sacrifice and commitment to God, holding nothing back? Or a person who just blends in with everyone else? You see, Christianity is all about commitment to God. Full and total commitment. That is what Christ demanded from all of His followers and disciples. And here in this passage tonight, that is what Paul calls us to do as well. To fully and totally commit our hearts, our mind, and our lives to God and to knowing Him and living for Him. The question is, what areas in my life need change? What areas need growth? Let's close with a word of prayer tonight. Father God, I thank you for this passage and this truth. And Father, I know that there are many things in this passage that you have brought to my mind and my memory, areas of growth that I need areas in my life that I have a long way to go. And there are probably areas even now that I have not yet even realized. Father, I pray not only for myself, but for every person in here tonight, that you would bring to our hearts and minds areas in our life that need growth, that need transformation, Maybe areas that we are not fully committed to you and serving you. That maybe we are holding something back. That, Father, you would help us, all of us in here, to really examine our hearts 
and our minds and to totally and fully commit everything to you. And Father God, I pray your blessings on us tonight as we leave, that you would help us to not just forget this truth. Father, to, to go home to study this passage, to reflect on it, and to see what areas in our life need change. What areas in our heart and our mind have been conformed more to the world than to your word? And that we would respond in obedience to your call to follow you, to hold nothing back. We thank you for all you do for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, something we can certainly take with us and think about this week and